Megan Daum is a writer and journalist, author of the book, The Problem With Everything, and host of the podcast, Unspeakable. In this conversation, we talk about her growing disillusionment with the media and interest in heterodox thinkers that she wrote about in her viral hit from a couple of years ago called Nuance, A Love Story. We talked about how tribalism and belonging had taken over from seeking truth. I think the problem with everything is that we're ultimately lonely. Humans are are lonelier than ever, and they are craving affiliation, not just social community. Obviously, people want community. I think they want affiliation. They want to feel like they have a uniform. They belong to a group. And this has become the best way to do it. To align yourself with an ideology um, is to really feel less alone in the world. So I think people's emotional sort of visceral um, sense of soothing that they get from aligning themselves eclipses any kind of cognitive dissonance they may have about what that doctrine is actually representing. And also about how the heterodox counterpoint to the mainstream became a new orthodoxy itself. It's really hard. And this is why the the sense-making heterodox IDW space became a group, because all those people felt excommunicated from their their old liberal friends. And so they found one another. I mean, I'm sure you're guilty of this too. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna I'm now I have this other group. But you know, so you're doing the exact same thing. But a lot of us, I think, felt lonely. And so I certainly felt very, um, there was something really nice about discovering that there were other people as frustrated with this as I was. But where do you go from there? Hope you enjoy this conversation. Megan Down, welcome. Thanks, David. Good to be here. Yeah, so... I don't know if uh, our viewers will be familiar with you. You released something like a viral article a few years ago called Nuance, A Love Affair. A love story. Yes. A love story. A love story. Yes. Um, Yeah. And I remember that at the time being really struck by it. Like it was beautifully written and it talked about your um, kind of your journey into what you called free speech YouTube at the time. And then got the uh, name, the intellectual dark web a little while afterwards and obviously became sort of this big cultural meme, this cultural kind of force. Um, Maybe let's, before we sort of go on and kind of talk about where we're at now, which I'd love to do, kind of just compare notes, talk about our respective journeys and our respective positions now. Maybe let's, let's recap. What was that article about and, and what were you kind of covering in that and where are you at now with relation to it? Yeah, that article came out in 2018. I think it was August of 2018. So I was in the middle of writing uh, my book, The Problem with Everything, which was, it's not a very long book. It's like just over 200 pages, but it was the most excruciating book writing experience of my life. I've published six books and uh, this one was um, just a sort of epic struggle for reasons that we can get into, but uh, yeah, I was writing about the new culture wars and I was trying to kind of look at generational divides within the conversation around feminism, for instance, that's how it started out for me. I kind of started following these sense-making heterodox kind of conversations. I don't think either of those terms were around at the time. I started following them maybe around 2014, 2015, watching people, on YouTube, talk to one another. Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter were kind of my my gateway on blogging heads. Uh, but yeah, so I was I started writing a book around 2016, kind of about all of this. And uh, yeah, I guess at some point um, I had written a piece about the IDW in the Los Angeles Times. I was a Los Angeles Times columnist at the time. I was an op-ed columnist there from about 2005 to 2016, 17 or so. I did little dribs and drabs for a couple of years after that. But uh, yeah, I, I was I, I got really immersed in this in this world of of Sam Harris and and you know Christina Hoff Summers and Camille Paglia and um, these people kind of talking to one another on YouTube, and suddenly it was being called the IDW, 
Um, Barry Weiss had written her big piece, I think, in the uh, was it early 2018 or maybe even 2017? I can't remember. No, it wasn't because 2017 was when Evergreen happened. So it must have been 2018. And I thought, oh, my gosh, my whole book is is about this. But now suddenly everybody's starting to talk about this. So, you know, I, I, I've been into this band before anybody was. So um, I ended up taking kind of a piece of my book and uh, extrapolating it and making it into a long standalone essay that ended up being called Nuance, A Love Story. And the conceit really, um, it wasn't just about this kind of sense-making apparatus in and of itself. It had to do with the fact that I had gotten divorced and, you know, my husband and I, for all of our problems, we were really intellectual allies. We just had amazing conversations about the world and we saw, you know, we saw sort of ideological hypocrisy the same way and in the same places. And so um, we had a, a very amicable split, but when that split happened, I lost that conversation and I realized that I had replaced it by watching other people's conversations. So, so that was kind of the conceit of the piece. And it was called Nuance, A Love Story, My Affair with the Intellectual Dark Web. And um, I, it was about 7,000 words long and I could not sell it to any publication. I, I wrote it and I have written for every publication pretty much out there, The New Yorker, New York Times Magazine, New Republic, Harper's, go down the list. I sent it everywhere. None of them would touch it. And I finally ended up publishing it on Medium and it went viral. And it was like pretty much the biggest piece of my career, um, certainly in a digital media sense. Uh, and there we were. So that's how I kind of entered into this into this mix. Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to speaking to you because you've got a sort of similar background and that you were you've been part of kind of the legacy media for, for quite a while and sort of seen the narrowness of the conversation in a very similar way to, I think, what attracted me to the the idea of the IDW as well. At, at the beginning was this sense of you can see the way that the Internet is eating away at mainstream media. You can see the way that it's influencing the kind of stories people are treating, the way it's just becoming far more performative. It's becoming far more... Um, outrage driven and you could sort of see this kind of eating away and and when the the idw was first named and you, you called it as a sense making apparatus and i think that's how it was initially pitched it's like okay maybe there's an alternative sense making system to the the obvious and growing failures of the mainstream media right. and and that's what really attracted me to it. it was like oh wow maybe there's a crowdsourced bottom-up solution to the problem that we're we're seeing and I think since then, what I've seen and the story that I think really needs to be told and I'm looking to to tell in various ways is I think the failures of the IDW, I wouldn't say the complete failure because I think they did provide a beachhead that moved the conversation on in some ways, for sure. But the failures of, I think, are a fantastic case study for the failures of alternative media. like. If the mainstream, we can tell the story of why mainstream media was failing and the institutions are failing. But I think the nature of the IDW and how that was constructed and how it then um, failed in many way ways, I think, is the perfect case study for the problems with alternative media. Um, so, so I'd love to go into that during this conversation in some way. But I also respect that your perspective is that in some ways we need to avoid talking about why we can't have the conversation. There's in many ways we should have the conversations. <laughs> yeah. Although it's very fun to talk about why we can't have the conversation, especially when you can't think of anything to say, you know? So what I always said as a, as a newspaper columnist, you can always tell when the person had to hit their deadline, but they couldn't think of something to say because it used to be that they would write about the culture of narcissism. You could always see that like, you know, every, 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 15th David Brooks column would be about the culture of narcissism. And now that's been replaced with the columnist saying, you know, I can't, I, I, I'm not allowed to say they, they write a, you know, the sort of perfunctory cancel culture piece because they actually don't have a topic for that week. So um, I think we all, we all find ourselves in that predicament. Hmm. And what was it that 
that attracted you to those conversations in the first place? What was it that you were feeling? Because you, you've got a career, a long-standing career in American journalism. Mine is in a, in a, is in a different context. Um, but I, and I think largely the, the other fascinating thing about this conversation more generally is that somehow we've all become part of the American culture war. One of the unexpected consequences of the big tech revolution, the social media revolution, is this sort of flattening of the conversation. And suddenly we are all inside the American uh, culture war dynamic. So th thank you very much for that one. For, yeah, you're for welcome. One. See, look what we look, look, look what we do for you. Kind of, you know, <laughs> you're exporting so much of your of your good stuff. Um, um, and this sort of but really, it feels much more polarized. Looking from the outside, from the UK, it does feel much more polarized. So I'm I'm really interested in kind of the the narrative or the story of how you felt this happening in media and where you wait how you've ended up where you are. Yeah, well, what attracted me to the alternative media conversation was the exact same thing that it attracted me to mainstream media when I was starting out as a writer. I only ever wanted to be somebody who was in conversation with other people, with the culture, with ideas. I live for ideas. I always have. I love story, but you know, I often say that the reason that I'm not a, a Hollywood screenwriter is because at the end of the day, I'm so much more interested in ideas than in story. So I wanted to be a writer because I wanted to engage with ideas in a counterintuitive way, in a surprising way, in a way that didn't necessarily go down easy. Um, I kind of found my niche as an essayist when I figured out that I could use my personal experience as a lens through which to look at the larger world. Um, you know, that's writing about yourself is is cute in your 20s and charming in your 30s. I, I don't know. In, in your 50s, it gets a little tedious. So but that's a, that's another pivot that we could talk about. But but yeah, I, I, to me, the job of writer was to was to kind of um piss people off sometimes and say things that were uncomfortable and articulate things that a lot of people were thinking or feeling, but perhaps unable to articulate themselves or afraid to say out loud, that was the job. And so at some point, I think starting around the mid aughts or so, that became the opposite of the job. We weren't supposed to kind of unsettle our readers. We were supposed to, to placate them. And that was totally uninteresting and, in fact, exasperating. So when I started to notice that there was this other sphere where people were talking the way we always talked, that was incredibly attractive. Um, so it wasn't like it was new. It was like I was finding the old thing in this new place. Mm. And so what were the topics that you were sort of seeing? What were the topics that you, you felt were getting off off? the table for American journalism in particular? Well, I mean, I was coming at it from a place of, I was noticing it in the conversation around women. I mean, mind you, this was before we became obsessed with race. So probably around 2013, 2014, I noticed that there was a lot of stuff um, in digital media where it's like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to call you out. I remember the beginning of the call out culture that just the sort of rhetoric around that. And there were people, you know, the, the littlest infraction um, would kind of get you pilloried, um, not necessarily even on on Twitter. I mean, certainly on Twitter, but I was seeing it in comment sections and not even just in comment sections like like a, a site like Jezebel, which was um, a digital it was part of the Gawker umbrella, I think. And um, it used to be hilarious. It was it was a women's site but they would make fun of women's magazines and they would show what had been photoshopped and, and these models. And it was just hilarious. It was irreverent. And, you know, you never had any sense that, that as, as a, fe you know, within the sort of smart thinking women in the world, there was any kind of rift. It's like, we were all kind of making fun of the same things and laughing at ourselves as well as sort of critiquing the culture. And I noticed in Jezebel started to kind of go in this direction of obsessing about the patriarchy, some, amorphous, ill-defined definition of the patriarchy, idea of intersectionality, again, ill-defined, misapplied, um, the idea that men were inherently 
oppressive and therefore toxic and therefore um, uh, on a pedestal and could be punched up to. So there was a lot of beating up men in the name of punching up to some sort of more powerful entity. And I found that actually sexist. I felt like it was really counterproductive and contradictory. So I'm just using Jezebel as, as one example, but I started to see that across across the board. And so it's funny because when I discovered Glenn and John talking on blogging heads, they were talking about race in exactly the way I wanted to talk about women's stuff. So like, I'm a white chick, so I can't talk about race, but I can, this is the one area, you know, I, I can kind of critique. And it was incredibly relieving to hear them do something that was, that I wanted to do. Like, this is allowed. Okay. You're allowed to, you're allowed to do this in a certain way. Um, so that was kind of my, my entry point, but there, frankly, there were a lot of people talking about this stuff in a way that I didn't think was quite right and very productive. So it was frustrating. It was really a, a matter of finding the kind of, you know, diamonds in the, in the rough, so to speak. So you mentioned the problem with everything. That's your, that was your book. Yes. What yes. is the problem with everything? <laughs> well, I think the problem with everything is that we're ultimately lonely. Humans are are lonelier than ever, and they are craving affiliation, not just social community. Obviously, people want community. I think they want affiliation. They want to feel like they have a uniform. They belong to a group. And this has become the best way to do it. To align yourself with an ideology um, is to really feel less alone in the world. So I think people's emotional sort of visceral um, sense of soothing that they get from aligning themselves eclipses any kind of cognitive dissonance they may have about what that doctrine is actually representing. I mean, I know people who would rather they, they, they know that sort of what they're, you know, spouting off on Facebook isn't quite right or that they're leading. Oh, I know I'm being emotional. I know, I know, but you know, it's, it's, you know, it, there's a bunch of fascists out there. They don't really think that, but it's worth it to them because they want to be part of their group. It's, it's really hard. And this is why the, the sense making heterodox IDW space became a group because all those people felt excommunicated from their their old liberal friends and so they found one another i mean i'm sure you're guilty of this too it's like oh my gosh i'm gonna i'm now i have this other group but mm. you know so you're doing the exact same thing but a lot of us i think felt lonely and so i certainly felt very um there was something really nice about discovering that there were other people as frustrated with this as i was but where do you go from there yeah, that's a good question. And that was, I think, one of the things that really did attract people to these conversations at the beginning. I remember the the event, the Pangburn event that was due to happen in New York and then became it kind of the whole thing imploded. Uh, it was due to be a, a huge event with lots of the big names and Pangburn, which is another fascinating little kind of detour. What what impact that whole Pangburn collapse had on this conversation where suddenly from nowhere you had Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris in the O2 arena and you had all of these like big big conversations in huge venues that was all based on Travis Pangburn's kind of dubious accounting and megalomania and how that I think flattered the egos of many of the the kind of big beasts who were part of it at the beginning but i think there was a another huge missed opportunity to make it into more of a kind of decentralized mass well m mass movement or a grassroots movement at least that i think came through a little bit in new york when the when the event was cancelled and then a few people basically found venues for those who'd already bought their tickets and had bought their their flights and hotels and turned up and that became like a, a huge experience of the people who went and, and basically just met other people who were interested in the ideas, had the conversations. And there was the sense of a kind of nascent um, 
Yeah, n- a nascent movement that I think was never really tapped into because there was this disjunct between the big figures on the stage and the people who are interested in the ideas, and that never really got, um, yeah, the the potential of it never really got going. I think, which mm-hmm. was was one of the the shames. But also, I think there's another another kind of tangent you can pick up on whichever one of these you want to. But the other tangent is. I think we are in a different place now. I remember in 2018 bringing out the the series of films about Jordan Peterson and kind of feeling this sense of pe- many of my kind of former friends kind of just distancing in some way. Or like, I'm not sure what's going on here and I don't quite get what you're paying attention to. And then there's a whole series about gender as well that I think were kind of like, oh, what are you talking about? Kind of like the it was men and women after me too. And it was trying to kind of, um, yeah, it wasn't really jumping on the, the me too bandwagon in that way. Um, and there was this sort of sense of, well, oh, I'm not sure what you're up to, but then in the three or four years since, I would say that almost everyone who had those doubts back in the day has had their own run in with some form of cancel culture or some form of seeing their friends attacked or some kind of, so I, I think the argument of there is something there is something on the left that you need to be aware of has been won for, for most people. The question of what to do about it and how much of a grip that has on the media and on the institutions is another open question. But I think the, the kind of raising the alarm part of the conversation that was going on in 2018 is no longer there. And also the fact that the heterodox space has become its own orthodoxy in so many places the nature of the ecosystems that we're part of the nature of the media ecosystems we're part of if you have supposedly heterodox perspectives you probably don't encounter anything other than that because of the nature of the the filter bubbles you've made for yourself that's certainly true online that's certainly true in the kind of the way that you're being steered on on youtube and in the facebook groups that you're part of so it's so like we're in a different place, and I think that there was a there was a necessary counter movement to the mainstream that sort of went under the name of heterodox back in the day. But I think we're in a very different place now, and I think the yeah that that we're in the need of a more sophisticated conversation that represents like a potential synthesis or a, and also a potential kind of recognition of the values that are still held in many of the um what's called the kind of legacy perspective Mm -hmm. well i'm i'm encouraged to hear you say that because i kind of feel like they there there are some holdouts i've noticed i mean I, i certainly people are growing weary of you know the woke revolution whatever you want to call it i don't like to use the word woke but um I don't know. I mean, I I have noticed in places where you know there are people who just really like to talk about how there's no such thing as cancel culture. I mean, I had a listener actually write to me yesterday about Mark Marin, you know, the the podcaster here in the in the US. He's a yeah. he's a comedian. He was one of the first podcasters. So he had he was doing podcast he's a he's a he's a comedian and uh, you know, he was a sort of kind of alt alt scene kind of guy back in the 90s and and early aughts and so he just started doing this podcast out of his garage maybe i don't know 15 years ago now interviewing comedians and he had a huge following i loved his show i listened to it all the time he had a very direct he was all about honesty like i just you know honesty 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 people just being very real and authentic no bullshit that was what was nice about his show no bs And he got bigger and bigger and Barack Obama came to his house and came to the garage and he interviewed him because obviously Obama's handlers realized that Mark Maron was like really hip and this was this was the thing to do. And, you know, I haven't listened to Mark Maron in the last couple of years. And I sometimes wonder if it's because, well, I just there's all these other podcasts that I'm mainlining and I don't have time. But every time I do dip back in there's something there's a there's a remove it's like he doesn't want to go into the same places and i had a listener of my podcast write to me yesterday 
saying that he felt really he had been very attached to Mark Marin and that he had noticed, I guess Mark Marin was interviewing somebody last week or something. Um, and the interview was preceded by some whole monologue about how cancel culture didn't exist. And this was just kind of a narrative of of people on the right. And of course, you know, I think the word fascist was thrown around. And and my listener had been really heartbroken to hear Mark Marin doing this because it was so antithetical to how the show started and really how podcasting started. He was a, a, a pioneer. And so this is a circuitous way of sort of addressing your, your question. I don't know if somebody like Mark Marin, who really represents a, a pretty tangible demographic, these are, these are people in urban communities, you know, blue, blue state, coastal urban centers, comic sensibility, high on the irony scale can really hear this kind of thing. If, if they still are going around feeling good about saying that cancel culture doesn't exist, I don't think we're there yet. I don't, I can't believe that Mark Marin doesn't believe that cancel culture exists, but for whatever reason, he's incentivized to, to keep repeating that. And mm. I would love to know where that, what that incentive is. I've tried to get him. I, I reached out. I, I would, I would like to have him on my show. I'm kind of torn because I would love to have him on my show and talk about that, but I don't think he would answer it. I don't know that he would answer the question. Yeah. I think there's a, I mean, I'm when I say that I feel like the things have shifted it. I'm, I'm speaking, I guess, mostly from my friends and acquaintances, like just about all of the people back in 2018 I can I can think of over a dozen who were sort of initially dubious and have sort of privately come to me and sort of right they, oh your your actual friends yeah 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 I mean they they've seen their they've seen some of their friends get kind of anonymous websites made criticizing them for kind of stuff that's taken out of context and they've had yeah they they've had they've been kind of yeah. attacked by junior staff in their organization for supposed racism or bigotry or something that was right. just completely manufactured they've they've had experience of being kind of kneecapped in meetings by people playing grievance cards and so i think yeah. that that feels different i think there is a there's still a real question about how the how you fight back against those tactics being used in public especially where reputation destruction and like especially where where there isn't really still much of a um social cost to negative or erroneous accusations like i think right, the only right. time, the only time that you'll really kind of move forward is when there is actually a social cost behind people making making false accusations or weaponized accusations and i don't think i don't think we know how to do that in the age of social media or, or what to do about it. And I guess the, the important thing for, for me certainly is to like have created an environment where I feel like to, to most degrees I can, I can say whatever I want and that there is a, an audience for, for hearing things that, that have a, but I think what, what I find really increasingly tiring is this sort of sense of, oh, we're having the conversations that others can't and we're 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 free of the obligations and we're free of and it just becomes a new group think it becomes a new orthodoxy right. and it becomes a new group think and it's like no I, there, there are still topics that you won't touch on there are still topics and i think jay shapiro wrote this amazing piece which i'll bring up on screen at the moment about the the idw um i think it's called be careful in the dark where he said there's another dark conversation that everyone who's paid attention to the progress of this this movement or this meme or whatever it is is aware of and it's 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 also unspoken it's like who are they giving a free pass to because of their friendships who are they kind of seeing in positive lights or saying positive things about because they fancy them who are the people who no one's stepping out of line to criticize because of aligned incentives all of this stuff just becomes a new it becomes a new thing and it's exactly the same that eric right. weinstein in the glitch in the matrix 2 we put out origin of the intellectual dark web said 
the problem with the mainstream is that the institutions run by he, he's obviously got this term the disc the distributed idea suppression complex and other <laughs> other frames he's made up which have stuck it just rolls really off well. the tongue, doesn't it? sorry it rolls off the tongue doesn't it the uh yeah what is it again the dis sorry disc. say that again. disc it stands for distributed ideas suppression complex right yeah um and his his perspective in that piece, the glitch in the Matrix Two, was that the mainstream institutions um, enforce conformity by platter or plomo. The consensus is usually achieved through some sort of incentivizing people, as the uh, as the mobs, uh, the violent mobs in Mexico say, plato or plomo. Do you want silver or do you want lead? So you're given a certain amount of encouragement to come to a particular perspective, maybe in terms of grant money or speaking opportunities. And you're given a disincentive, which is this is what's going to happen to your career if you don't fall in line. So plata, silver or lead. And so you get grant speaking opportunities if you if you follow a certain narrative. If you don't, then you can find your career running into running into difficulties, all of those things. And it's like, that's absolutely. I think that's absolutely true, and there's groupthink in so many of the different institutions, which is why the initial need for a sense making alternative was was clearly there. But I think as soon as you create a thing called the IDW or called the heterodox space, you you replicate the problems of the mainstream. So you've basically yeah. created another system with its own incentive structures, and you can see them. You can actually see kind of the the aligned incentives, the way that certain things are not criticized, the way that, and it becomes another warping truth factor. And it's, the, the problem is that all of those warping truth factors are then around very, per because everyone is their brand, the warping truth factors are around the personal flaws of the people rather than the systematic flaws, which you get with the, the institutions. Narcissism, audience capture, all of these things come in and I think warp the landscape around the content creators. And the other kind of irony is that all of the things that warp our experience as users of social media, I think, are then infinitely more impactful on content creators. Yeah. Well, and also, when you want to talk about privilege, I mean, in order to uh, to say what you want to say, there you have to have a privilege of some kind of independent revenue stream you either have to kill it be killing it on substack or be independently wealthy i mean it's funny because when i started off in as a writer in journalism i was constantly frustrated by the the classism like what was always unspoken was that in order to make it in a creative field you really have to be independently wealthy you know we have these conversations about why are all the magazine editors white elite college educated people why is everybody at the new yorker uh somebody who went to yale well the reason is not because there's some grand conspiracy to keep everybody else out it's because in order to take those relatively low paying jobs in order to take an entry level job in book publishing or magazine publishing and live in new york city you've got to have other sources of income my first job out of college I made $18,000 a year. I worked at a glossy magazine. I worked at Condé Nast as an editorial assistant. And the person who hired me in HR said, well, I mean, presumably you have other ways of making money. I mean, this, this isn't the kind of job where, you know, this is not about a you know living wage kind of job. This is another kind of job. And so, you know, it's that, that kind of phenomenon existed back in legacy media where, you know, if, you know, if, if you were going to work at the Paris Review or someplace that was really intellectual, you had to have other. Oh, my God. Let me say that again. This phenomenon existed in legacy media. So if you were going to have a sort of elite, prestigious intellectual job, uh, you were going to have to have some other way of, of funding yourself. And now what we have are the people who can, who are sort of free to speak, you know, free to have the dangerous conversations. We either have to be, you know, having a lot of Substack subscribers 
or just have family money in places. I think that's another dirty secret. I'd like to know how many of these IDW types are actually from wealthy backgrounds. That's that's unexplored. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, true. I would love to be able to, I can't, you know, I I am not from a wealthy background. I, I, I worked, you know, wrote every kind of thing for decades. I wrote for women's magazines. I wrote celebrity profiles. I wrote ad copy. I did, you know, everything. And I can't, I, I can't make a living doing my podcast. And so the question is like, wh- where's the money coming from? I think, I can't believe that all of these podcasters are actually surviving just from their, their ads or their Patreon supporters. There's, there's other things in place. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And also the, even the sort of sub stackization and the, the Patreonization of the podcast is its own warping factor as well. Like I can think of a lot of, and that, that's a concern. I, yeah. As a, as a journalist to, who's worked more in print the, than I have, I'm interested if you are equally concerned by that. Like you've got some of these amazing writers who have left many of the mainstream publications and gone on to Substack. But my concern is even that fact of them being on Substack, whereas before they would probably write a a, a range of content about different stories. Now they've got a specific audience who probably want a specific thing. Like, do do you see that as a warping factor on, on, on journalism do you think it's a positive or a negative and no it's a, it's a negative i mean because you have to once you go to the subscription model you're beholden to your readers in a way that you weren't when you were beholden to advertisers you weren't writing to to appeal to bloomingdales because they had taken out a full page ad on the back of the metro section of or you know of the a section of the new york times every day you were you know you you were writing for editors you were writing for a sort of consensus sensibility so now that that's business model has been done away with you you have subscribers that are that are saying hey we're paying you out of our pockets like you know we're giving you the shirt off off our back so you've got to give us what we want in return you know i do the podcast every week I can tell you every time I do uh, a show about some kind of cancel culture thing, uh, if I have on, you know, I had on Sam Harris, I, if I have on, I just had um, Batya Ungar Sargon, who has a book called Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. I think that's the subtitle, something like that. It's a great book. She's fantastic. But she's talking about all of this stuff and people are ravenous for it. The download numbers on that kind of interview are are exponentially higher than if I have somebody on talking about, uh, you know, the the journey in and out of Islamic extremism. (laughs) That's an important conversation to have. And the numbers, it's just, it's just night and day. So if I was going to, you know, if, if I really cared deeply about having hitting it out of the park every week with the downloads, I would I would bang on about cancel culture every week. I probably should. I probably should. But I, I would say I couldn't sleep at night. Maybe I could sleep at night because it would be so boring. I would sleep during the day because I was so bored and then I would be up at night feeling guilty. So mm. I don't know. Yeah, no, I feel the same. Like it's it's obvious that anti-woke or anti-cancel culture stuff does really good numbers. And I know that, yeah, I, I guess I wish that the, 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 the viewers would be a little bit more wary of that, like knowing how, how kind of easy or how much, how much how attractive that kind of content is. I think may, people may sort of, might be helpful if they sort of developed a little bit more skepticism around it because it's such a powerful, that's the other thing that I'm feeling now with the in 2021 compared to 2018 is there was a sort of nascent growing sense of like a heterodox counterpoint to the mainstream. Whereas now I feel like it's almost, it's almost dominant, certainly online and yeah. certainly in the, in the, in the places where I am, there was a, there was a great piece by um, Ben Sixsmith where he talked about that 
was his phrase that so much of woke culture is shadow boxing an imaginary cultural hegemon. So they're sort of criticizing. So that a, a lot of sort of woke, for want of a better word, um, criticism is sort of seeing, oh, well, the, the two person family, the kind of patriarchy is still dominant it's like have you seen any hollywood films recently have you looked at some of the hiring policies of all the big companies i mean the idea that there is still this kind of 1950s style traditionalist hegemon is is ludicrous so it's kind of so the, the his perspective was like so much of woke posturing is is shadow boxing an imaginary hegemon i see the same thing on the other side where so much of the sort of anti-cancel culture or anti of the, the sort of heterodox perspective is shadow boxing another kind of dead hegemon, which is sort of this kind of imaginary unitary MSM perspective, which is really weak if it still exists, is held by sort of maybe CNN and a, a few other people, but hardly anywhere else. Like it's it's kind of it's again sort of shadow boxing an imaginary hegemon a lot of the time. And it's become right. its own its own hegemonic force. Yes. You know, another thing I, I notice is the weaponization of the word nuance and the concept of nuance. So, you know, we kind of got into this space. That's another term I, that makes me cringe, but we can't think of a better one uh, because we wanted to have nuanced conversations. And my viral piece was called Nuance, a Love Story. And I still think that's really the best summation of our goals and, and what we're trying to to get to. But I've noticed people online, you know, it kind of in, in social justice circles, kind of, you know, knee jerk, you know, snark on Twitter. Oh, another nuanced take or, you know, you're part of that nuanced crowd. And as if it's some kind of right wing dog whistle or a way of kind of getting around, you know, cloaking your 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 racism or whatever it is. And it's really I, I find that very worrying. And um I hear people talk about nuance constantly. I don't know if I'm just hyper aware of it, but it's got to come up 12 times a day, even in totally unrelated. I was listening to some interview. I think it was, I can't remember. It was like two musicians or it was a musician being interviewed or somebody. And the word nuance came up in that context and they weren't talking about the culture wars. But it's funny because I did a little, I did a little um, talk recently for um, a group of people that were not really in the culture business. Some of them, they were sort of a combination of Silicon Valley people and kind of venture capitalist people, some tech entrepreneurs. <laughs> I don't run around in these circles normally. It was a strange situation, but I gave a couple, I gave a little, little mini talk about this nuance problem and how it was being weaponized and nuance was everywhere. And my, I kind of took this tack, well, nuance is everywhere now. Nuance is all the rage. Like it's practically had its moment. And people were coming up to me afterwards and saying like, I never heard that. I don't, I don't know what you, that's, that's so interesting. I didn't realize that nuance was a thing and I certainly didn't know it was on its way out already. So, you know, again, we get, <laughs> we get into our little bubbles and, and who knows? Um, but but again, I think that really what we're trying to get to in this conversation is how to maintain intellectual honesty without branding it and then undermining it, undermining the mission entirely. And it may just it may not be possible, um, at least in this format. I, I sometimes think we just have to go back to people having in-person conversations. People need to have that be their main nutrient source. It needs to be hanging out at the bar with your friends or talking over coffee. It can't just be talking, people talking to one another on, on YouTube if, and for broadcast purposes. Mm. It's got to be not recorded. Off the record might be like the new new thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. It, it's certainly something that we think about a lot and i think i think you might be right there are there's something that i mean it's, it's a cliche to say that you can't talk to people in person as you would online and a lot of the the way that we communicate now can only happen because we don't see the people that we're talking to or we don't see them as fully kind of human because we're interacting through kind of ways that are kind of fundamentally inhuman but i think there yeah. is something to that i think there is something to the idea that 
can we have yeah can, can we have kind of ironically safe spaces like the, the the kind of paradox of that is that we probably do need safe spaces to be able to have these conversations yeah i think the not recording stuff having having a space right exactly it's it's safe because it's contained so i do hangouts for my podcast listeners we've been having we've been getting together on zoom calls every other week or so to discuss specific episodes and it's off the record it's not recorded um nobody is to you know i'm assuming nobody's holding up their phone and secretly recording it and it's great it's it, you know I, we kind of figured out how to do it it's a limited group we decide we pick one episode and we decide that we're going to talk only about that one and it's been really, really wonderful because it's mostly the same people that come every time and they don't, they're from all over the world actually. And um, they are able to, to talk about stuff in a way that they're not with their friends in, in, re, in real life for whatever reason, but they also know that it's not being broadcast. It's not part of the podcast. It's, it's just in and of itself. I mean, you're doing this with your this is very much what your course is about and the, you know, get people together in pods and, mm. and having this experience. So, I mean, I'm curious, do people tell you that, that they are getting a sense of relief um, from that experience? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think people find a real sense of community when they find others who are interested in the same ideas. And I mean, some of the, some of the sessions people, Obviously, recently, the whole vaccine topic has been something that people have been talking about a lot in some of the the in-person sessions or online in-person sessions. And people have felt that there's no judgment. Like we've got people from all the different sides of that kind of particular argument, and everyone feels able to express themselves. They don't feel that there's any judgment um, on what they yeah, what, what their views are. And I think that's something that I, I find really valuable. Like I'd hate to have an environment where people didn't feel safe to say what their particular perspectives were. It occurred to me that there are entire generations that are coming up now that have never known a world in which every conversation they had is not potentially recorded, right? I mean, that would just do something to your brain, mm. your whole sense of speaking and listening is is changed by that i mean i always say like you know people ask me why are you so why why do you not care if people are mad at you with what you write why are you so brave whatever and it's because the first 20 years of my career were i i was i didn't i wasn't looking over my shoulder every time i was writing i just i wrote somebody edited it somebody smart edited it and it went out in the world. And if people were angry about it, they would send a letter to the editor that I would that would maybe get published and I would maybe read. And that was that. And, you know, we are the last generation that had that experience as journalists and as writers. And that is an incredible gift, you know, that we were able to kind of think in private mm. and, and make mistakes in private. Uh, it, that's doesn't that's not available anymore. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I really wonder about the generation growing up now and what what it means to basically. Did you read the book? I think it was called The Circle by Dave Eggers. Dave Eggers. I haven't read that, but yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a flawed book in many ways, but I think it captured this yeah. this gap. So the, the, the topic is it, the circle is kind of a combination of Facebook and, and Google and all these different sort of Silicon Valley companies. And it's the story of a woman who works for the company and ends up being filmed all the time, kind of wearing a So It ends up with complete transparency. And she's she's rated on all of these different kind of metrics all the time. And what happens, it, it tells really well the sort of sense of the gap that opens up in her soul, effectively, between her public persona and the real her, which kind of disappears. There's this sort of nagging little conscience in the back that maybe it's not fully authentic, but there's really this sort of sense of, yeah, it's it's sort of it's pretty dystopian, but it but it it really does kind of 
summarize kind of what is lost in this sense of a kind of life lived fully in public? Yeah. I mean, do you find yourself having off the record conversations with your friends? Do they do what they do to me? My friends, I hear this all the time. Oh, Megan, I want to say, I can only say this to you. I, I want to say this thing. I want to talk about this thing, but I know you're the only person that's not going to like, you know, think I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> do you, do you have that in your life? Yeah, Pretty, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, the kind of paradox of saying, oh, what, what if, what if your WhatsApp got hacked and then suddenly all of your WhatsApp messages were made public? That would be everyone's <laughs> kind of biggest nightmare, I think. See, I'm um, not on that. I'm such a technophobe. I don't use any... I, I have no social media on my phone and I've never used WhatsApp. That's a that's a good place to be, probably. Well, I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, that's part of, I think, why, for me at least, it feels like things have shifted quite fundamentally in the last couple of years because I, I do have those conversations. I do have that sort of sense of relief when people from different friend groups or whatever come up to me and there's an implicit kind of, Oh, I'm it's a relief to be able to talk about this with someone. Yeah. Are there things that you still feel you can't talk about? Like either on the show or in your life? Yes. Mostly because I feel like I don't know enough about them. Oh yeah. You're very a, meticulous that way. Yeah, I think may, maybe it's a journalistic thing. I mean there's there's topics that I would never, that I feel are hard to talk about generally. Like I had a real, quite a difficult process with the whole climate thing during during COP recently, where I was kind of thinking about different people that I could have on. And it's become such a polarizing topic. There's so many different aspects to it, I think, are really fascinating. I think the fact that it that it does have this kind of religious fervor to it is a really interesting co- part of the conversation but is it possible to just talk about that without talking about the science and like it's probably the biggest topic among the people that I'm closest to in in many Mm. ways professionally and I'd love to know I'd love to kind of host conversations on it but I realized I can't really host one conversation without hosting more than one so (laughs) Like there's so many different perspectives. There's the collapsologists. There's the kind of renewables people. There's the kind of um, the the adapt and survive types. Like any one of those would piss off somebody, and I'm right. willing to piss people off. But I also don't want to kind of present an unbalanced view. So I kind of realized I either I either get one, I either get everybody on or nobody, and I ended up. See, this, you're you're a completist, but this is what we're talking about. There's there's no there's no a whole story has never been told. There's not two sides. There's a million sides. You're driving yourself crazy. Like yeah. that's, you're, you're so meticulous. You're, it's your own worst enemy. Have you had on Michael Schellenberger? No. Do you know who he is? He's yes, the I'm familiar apocalypse with him. never guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he, he, it's a good example. He's one of those that I think would be good, but I would like, I would like to have, I was thinking about maybe hosting a debate with more than one person. Um, but then the but yeah. debate thing is a whole, that's a whole other thing. Like I'm, I'm less and less interested in debate because I feel like it's inherently limited. People say you only have on people who agree with you. Why don't you have a you know debate with somebody? But I just feel like it's in order to win a debate, you have to sort of, you're required to not be nuanced. You're required to not give any oxygen to the other side. I mean, maybe calling it a debate is the wrong thing, but yeah, di- dialogue perhaps. But then you've got yeah. to have the right people that can go there. We did a, a, a hosted a conversation with about the lab leak hypothesis that went out last week with Stuart Neal and Yuri Dagan. I heard it. And, it was really good. It was yeah, really it worked good. really well because they they kind of made friends with each other on Twitter. And they they weren't they weren't friends on Twitter for a while. They were sort of like kneeling at each other, but then they built up a respect for each other, and so they had that relationship going into it. And I also was very clear beforehand. It's like this is this is more about light than heat. We don't want to. It's not about sort of trying to win. And they both, 
I, I thought it went really, really well. So, but that only works when you have people who are probably have that kind of relationship and that kind of, yeah, goodwill towards each other. So it's quite a difficult balancing act. Well, and it was so granular, a lot of yeah. the conversation. So they're exactly. not ideological, they're experts, right? Sort yeah. of. So that's yeah. a little different. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know yeah. what the solution is. Yeah. Is there anything that we didn't speak about that we should before we complete? Oh, I'm I, I'm sure. Um, I guess. Uh, yeah. I mean, how do you? What do you think is the future of this of this space? Where do you hope to be in say five years? Do you want to mm. just have moved through this moment, or do you want to? Do you feel like how, we're just how how would you summarize it? the space? Uh, I think right now it's in it's it's a, it's in a sort of toddlerhood. Like in its infancy, it was kind of exciting and it could have gone in any number of places. But now it feels very kind of tantrumy and um, and needy and kind of just not not really cognitively coherent. Mm. Um, so I don't know. Um, I guess. I guess what I want to do is just. And, and where are you going? Yeah, the bounds of this space. You're talk, talking about the heterodox. IDW, yeah. I mean the heterodox yeah. space. Um, I think the thing to do is find a way to let the the public in more. I mean, right now it's just a lot of kind of semi-public, <laughs> self-appointed public intellectuals talking to one another and sometimes mm -hmm. at one another, and like you. I, I want to find ways to sort of bring in the, the world because that's what people want. I think people are are lonely and they can't be alone with their thoughts. They don't want to be. So people say, what is the problem with everything? I think it's that, you know, in order to be honest, in order to be completely honest and authentic in your thinking, you have to accept that you're alone. You can't just have like your partner who thinks exactly the same way you do or, or your club or your tribe, you have to just sit with yourself. And I think, I think humans are, they're really hard. They really have a hard time being alone. You know, I used to say like the, the two biggest ways people mess up in their relationships in their romantic partnerships, they, they think the other person's going to change and they can't be alone. If you can't be alone, then you're going to align yourself with, with anybody who's there. And I think that's some of what we have going on now. But if we can bring in more people, then I think that there's that's a sort of that is more conducive to um, to, to true nuance and to true uh, honesty of thought. Yeah, I think it's absolutely true that it needs to be more than just the kind of usual suspects. But like there has to be a, and I think what I've tried to do on Rebel Wisdom is to show some of those. Who some of those new, those new characters might be, and and I also think my my overall frame, and you did say sort of where I think this is going. I think where it has to go is further towards a more honest accounting of our psychological flaws of our makeup, because that's what I think has like the morality tale of the IDW is that those lesser or greater psychological flaws are the reason why it failed as a truth-seeking enterprise. Mm. The narcissism, the inability to accept being wrong, the aligned incentives, like all of those things. So I think we need a more sophisticated conversation around those kind of blind spots and those flaws that we all have. There has to be what feels that's happening as well. And maybe this is what you meant by sort of the toddler kind of uh, tantrum-y thing is that it's more about division than it is about mediation. There has mm -hmm. to be some kind of public example of what does it look like to work through division, to work through difficulty? How do you deal with, like, how do you deal with people who are multifaceted, that some of the things they do are really outrageous? But other things they do are really valuable. How do we deal with characters like that? 
Like how do yeah. we kind of, how do we, ironically, a lot of this language actually comes from, uh, I think, Eric, how do we dine a la carte? How do we recognize? Yeah. And, and, how, and how do people admit failure, admit, admit wrongdoing or admit flaws and then come back into the fold? What does that process look like? And, and I think ultimately, ultimately for me, the conversation, the IDW as it, as it standard stood was generally an example of what happens if you do sense making without personal growth without this sense of recognition of like what as, as we teach on the sense making course like bring in the shadow bring in an awareness of like the things that really trigger us and the other are things that we all, almost invariably have ourselves the things and and a sense of why are we being triggered by certain things can we expose ourselves to the best of the ideas on the other side and integrate integrate kind of both perspectives or as many perspectives as possible. But I think some sense of, I think the next iteration would have to be people who have the capacity for self-reflection, who have the capacity for working through their stuff, being, being kind of honest about what that is, about how we're all flawed people operating in difficult environments, trying to make sense of things outside the institutions in very limited ways, and that we'll get things wrong and recognizing that we are the, uh, we are the kind of creatures that don't really want to admit when we do. Uh, yeah. we're, to let, we're, we're prey to confirmation bias. We're prey to all of these different, um, yeah, blind David. spots and and yeah and i think bring that's where the conversation for me needs to go i i, I don't think of what there's a way out of the sense making crisis without that move towards yeah the a growth well, oriented perspective it's epistemic humility right yeah but david i mean before we go i'm just curious what do you think it is about you your temperament your psychology that makes you so allergic to bullshit is it something about the way you grew up? Is there something intrinsic to your character that makes you unable to tolerate the landscape as it's emerged over the last 10 years? Um, I've never thought of myself in that way. So, Well, but this um, is bothering you. Obviously, all of us in this space, there's something about us that we can't sit still. Yeah. You know, there, there are plenty of, we have plenty of, ex colleagues and peers who are just happy to go along with the program it doesn't mm. bother them as much why does this bother us so much yeah it's a very good question you can think about it and get back to me when i have you on my show but i you yeah. know i often ask myself like why are you on about this like why do i care why can't i let it go mm. and i think it is a flaw um is it a flaw or is it an overdeveloped sense? I mean, there is a kind of righteousness about it, I guess. So you've got to be careful not to kind of let let get too righteous, but this sort of sense of no, that's not okay. Yeah. Which, which in many ways is like what attracts people to like that's the that's the good thing that attracts people to journalism in the first place, is this sense of truth being Right. something in itself that is curative that is powerful that is a way of writing wrongs and giving voice to the people who don't have a voice and um yeah yeah and i actually i actually think like this there's an awful lot of power now without accountability i guess the thing that's pissing me off at the moment is this sort of sense of in the wider kind of heterodox space, I think there is there is a lot of power without accountability. It's like what mm. I've what I've talked about with the uncanny valley between the kind of legacy and the alternative. At the moment, you have and you have this where the legacy is doing a really bad job of holding things to account, but the alternative has no interest in holding things to account. So an awful <laughs> lot of bullshit then is able to metastasize in the alternative. And I think that's a lot of the, the, the nonsense we're seeing at the moment. So right. I, that's what I feel quite personally invested in at the moment. Well, you're carving out 
that that space. You're really the only one actually kind of holding holding these two sides, like really engaging with this with this phenomenon. This is your you own that. That's what I always tell my students. You you own that that idea, that that beef. I think that's your that feels like your intellectual mission. Great. Um, thanks. But it's hard. It's really hard. That's a that's a really hard one to tease out because you have to explain to people what these two two things even mean to begin with, hmm. and then what and then what the problem is. But and being be hated on, and being hated on both sides for it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> get a dog. Yeah. My dog's wandering around in the background. He's like, "Ah, oh, shut up!" All yeah. she does is talk at the computer about these things. <laughs> But yeah. yeah, he doesn't hate me too much. Megan, this was really great. I look forward to continuing the conversation on your podcast soon. Absolutely. Thank you, David. Um, I really I admire what you're doing. So it's great to talk with you always. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you'd like to join conversations like this, check out a digital campfire. You get access to a load of member only films. You can watch live, ask questions, Come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes, and you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below, and we'd love to see you soon.